In January 2024, a Russian T-90M tank, one of Moscow's most advanced frontline tanks, rolled into the Ukrainian village of Stepov hunting for targets. The 48-ton beast packed a 125mm cannon and composite armor designed to shrug off most infantry weapons. Its thermal optics cut through the winter haze. The crew was confident. Then, two American Bradley fighting vehicles appeared. What happened next shouldn't have been possible. For around 10 minutes, in drone footage that went viral worldwide, those two M2A2 ODSSA Bradleys, fighting using only their 25mm autocannons, systematically dismantled Russia's premier tank. They hit it repeatedly from close range. The T-90M's turret began spinning out of control after its traverse mechanism was damaged. The crew bailed out before the tank rolled into a tree line, abandoned and defeated. Here's what worried Pentagon analysts, that Bradley crew had completed its Bradley training in Germany just weeks earlier, according to open source reporting, and the vehicle that helped take down Russia's best export tank, a design that entered US service in 1981, a 40 plus year old platform the Army has been trying to replace since the 1980s. But instead of retiring the Bradley, the US has committed well over $2 billion since 2018 to a sweeping upgrade program. Those upgrades include Israeli active protection systems, new 675 horsepower engines, and a fully digitized electronic architecture that wasn't even imaginable when the first Bradleys rolled off the line. The question isn't why they're upgrading a Cold War relic. It's what the Army discovered on battlefields from Kuwait to Ukraine that made them bet billions on a platform they already tried to replace four separate times and failed every single one. The Bradley should be obsolete by now. It was designed to fight Soviet BMPs across the plains of West Germany, a war that never happened. Its original mission essentially ended when the Berlin Wall fell. Yet today, as hypersonic missiles reshape warfare and AI-guided drones stalk armor 24-7, the Army isn't just keeping the Bradley alive, it's modernizing it hard. Here's the anomaly. The Pentagon has spent 40 years trying to replace the Bradley. Four major programs, tens of billions in projected spending, Armored Systems Modernization, ASM, in the 1980s, Future Combat Systems, FCS, in the 2000s, Ground Combat Vehicle, GCV, canceled in 2014, Optionally Manned Fighting Vehicle, OMFV, rebooted and now rebranded as the XM-30 Mechanized Infantry Combat Vehicle. All of those initial replacement efforts were canceled or reset. Meanwhile, the thing they were trying to replace kept proving itself indispensable. In Desert Storm, Bradley's destroyed more Iraqi armored vehicles than the M1 Abrams, while losing just 20 vehicles, 17 to friendly fire, and only three to enemy action. In Iraq and Afghanistan, up-armored Bradley's absorbed IED blasts and RPG hits while often keeping crews alive even when the vehicles were written off. And now, in Ukraine, they're taking on modern Russian armor and surviving hits that would have killed crews in Soviet-era BMPs. Since 2018, the Army has steadily expanded Bradley A-4 upgrade work with BAE systems. Key recent awards include September 2023, about $274 million for M2A4, M7A4 production and upgrades, September 2024, roughly $440 million for additional Bradley A4s. December 2024, about $656 million more for A4 production and conversion. November 2025, a contract modification over $390 million to continue delivering Bradley A4s. When you include earlier A4 awards dating back to 2018, the cumulative value of Bradley A4 upgrade and production contracts now comfortably exceeds $2 billion. The Army's stated objective is 1,329 M2A4 and M7A4 vehicles by around fiscal year 2029, enough for nine armored brigade combat teams plus training and support fleets. As of mid-2025, about 985 had been ordered and over 580 delivered. At the same time, the Army is funding the XM-30 program. Two teams, General Dynamics Land Systems, based on the Griffin III, Ajax lineage, and American Rhine Metal, based on the Lynx KF-41, are building competing designs under a development effort worth roughly $1.6 billion across both vendors in the prototyping phases. The Army plans to down-select to a single design in 2027, with first unit equipped in the late 2020s and broader fielding likely stretching into the early 2030s. So if a replacement is coming, 
Why pour so much money into the Bradley? Three official reasons. The XM30 still carries technical and schedule risk. Modern threats are evolving faster than clean sheet designs can be fielded. And the Bradley brings something no new vehicle has yet. Four decades of combat proven reliability, doctrine, and logistics behind it. But there's a fourth explanation. And it starts with how the Bradley went from Pentagon joke to Desert Storm legend. To understand why the Bradley refuses to die, you have to understand what it was built to do and how completely it delivered when the shooting started. In the 1960s, the Soviet Union unveiled the BMP-1, the world's first true infantry fighting vehicle. It wasn't just a battle taxi. It had a 73mm gun, ATGM launcher, and full NBC protection. NATO had nothing comparable. U.S. infantry still rode into battle in the M113, an aluminum box with a machine gun. The Bradley was America's answer, but it took almost two decades of design churn, requirements creep, and political infighting before it entered service in 1981. Critics hammered it for being too heavy, too complex, and too expensive. About $3.17 million per vehicle in 1998 dollars, roughly $5.8 million in 2025 dollars. The 1998 dark comedy, The Pentagon Wars, turned its troubled development into a cultural punchline. Then came Desert Storm in 1991. Bradleys went to war alongside Abrams tanks and shocked everyone. They destroyed more Iraqi armored vehicles than the Abrams, largely through tow missile kills, but also with their 25mm guns against weaker side and rear armor, while losing only 20 vehicles, 17 of those to friendly fire. The Bushmaster cannon that critics said was too small chewed through BMPs and older tanks when it hit vulnerable aspects. Tow missiles reached out to 3.75 kilometers, and the Bradley's on-road speed of about 41 miles per hour let it keep pace with Abrams in the famous left hook that crushed the Republican Guard. Success created its own problem. As the Bradley proved itself, the Army bolted on more gear. Additional armor, explosive reactive tiles, IED jammers, better radios, new optics. Over time, combat weight crept up from around 50,000 pounds to nearly 80,000 pounds on later variants, an increase on the order of 10 to 13,000 pounds compared to early configurations. The suspension groaned, the 600 horsepower engine strained, the electrical system struggled to power all the added kit. The Bradley was literally being crushed under the weight of its own success. Enter the M2A4 upgrade. Army engineers had a choice, start over with a brand new vehicle or rebuild the Bradley's internals while keeping the hull, turret, and training base they already knew worked. They chose evolution over revolution. The M2A4 upgrade swapped in a 675 horsepower Cummins diesel, a strengthened transmission, and upgraded torsion bar suspension to handle the higher weight. Just as important, it adds a completely modernized digital power and electronics architecture able to support advanced sensors, jammers, and active protection systems. But there was still a vulnerability the original designers hadn't anticipated, and Ukrainian crews found it the hard way. The Ukrainian Bradley crew that went up against that T-90M in January 2024 had a secret weapon, not the 25mm cannon, not even their formal training. It was pattern recognition. The gunner, identified in Ukrainian media only by a call sign, often reported in open sources as Serhi, told reporters he'd studied Russian tank weak points extensively, including through modern armor simulations and video games like War Thunder. When his armor-piercing rounds couldn't reliably punch through the T-90M's frontal arc, he switched tactics. Instead of trying to kill the tank outright, he systematically blinded and crippled it. He walked 25 millimeters fire across the commander's cupola, the gunner's sight housing, the gun mantlet, and the turret ring junction, the same areas that armor analysts have long identified as vulnerable on many Soviet-derived designs. These are typically protected by much thinner armor than the glasses or turret cheeks, tens of millimeters instead of hundreds. Each 25 millimeter high explosive or armor piercing round hit like a sledgehammer. The T-90M's external optics shattered, its turret drive mechanism, exposed in places and dependent on vulnerable cabling and housings, took repeated hits. In the now famous footage, the turret begins spinning uncontrollably, a classic sign of traversy system damage. Blinded and unable to aim, the roughly four to five million dollar tank became a 48 ton liability. Here's the tactical revelation that episode underscored for Western planners. Against modern tanks, an infantry fighting vehicle like the Bradley doesn't need to penetrate main armor to be lethal. It just has to destroy the tank's external sensors, optics, and soft components. And modern tanks are covered in them, 
day slash night sights, thermal cameras, laser range finders, soft kill countermeasure sensors, communications antennas, all exposed, all vulnerable to a high rate of accurate 25 millimeter fire. This is where the M2A4E1 variant comes in, first publicly highlighted in US Army releases and defense reporting in 2024. The M2A4E1 adds the Iron Fist Light decoupled, IFLD, active protection system from Israel's Elbit systems. Iron Fist uses a combination of radar and infrared sensors to detect incoming rockets and anti-tank guided missiles, then fires small interceptor charges to destroy or deflect them before impact. Each Bradley mounts two launcher modules with four interceptor rounds total in the baseline configuration. Iron Fist was originally fielded to counter RPGs and ATGMs, but testing has shown it can engage some slower, low signature threats. In Ukraine, the number one killer of armor isn't traditional missiles. It's cheap FPV drones flown by operators wearing goggles, diving directly into weak spots. US planners now see hard kill APS like Iron Fist as one of several tools alongside soft kill jamming and better signature management to try to keep vehicles alive in that environment. The M2A4 E1 package doesn't just bolt on APS. It also adds an upgraded gunner's sight with high definition thermal imaging for better target ID at longer ranges. Environmental control units, ECUs, for crew and dismounts after earlier tests showed serious heat stress risks in 120 degree environments once more electronics were packed inside. Enhanced digital vitronics and cyber hardening for the new networked architecture. Improved IED jammer components designed to reduce the vehicle's electronic detectability while still disrupting enemy triggers. Here's the part most people miss. The Bradley isn't just being upgraded, it's being turned into a network node. The A4 architecture is built to plug into the Army's integrated tactical network and other digital battle management systems so every Bradley in an armored brigade shares a common picture. One vehicle spots a target at 2,000 meters with its sensors. Within seconds, that location can be shared across the formation, handed off to another Bradley, artillery, or unmanned systems for engagement. This network lethality is what the Army really cares about. The XM-30 is expected to have similar or more advanced connectivity, but it won't arrive at scale until the late 2020s and 2030s. Meanwhile, the Army expects to face near-peer threats like Russia and China in that same window. So the plan is clear. Upgraded Bradleys are the bridge force. Current plans call for 1,329 M2A4 and M7A4 vehicles by around 2029. As of mid-2025, roughly 985 had been funded and more than 580 delivered. The math says the quiet part out loud. The Army isn't just buying a few more years of service. It's committing to operate upgraded Bradleys alongside the XM-30 for at least a decade, possibly into the 2040s and even 2050, because evolutionary upgrades to proven platforms keep working, even when revolutionary programs slip. You cannot replicate 40 years of training, doctrine, spare parts networks, and mechanic experience with a clean sheet design on a PowerPoint slide. The Bradley's unexpected performance in Ukraine hasn't just impressed Western planners. It's forcing Russia to rethink its own assumptions. Start with the industrial base. Bradley upgrade work touches BAE systems facilities in Pennsylvania, Alabama, South Carolina, Minnesota, Michigan, and California, along with government depots like Red River Army Depot in Texas, which overhauls and remanufactures Bradley's. That's thousands of jobs in a supply chain that already exists and doesn't have to be built from scratch. Contrast that with the XM-30 program, where the Army expects to spend tens of billions over the life of the system. About $45 billion is a commonly cited top-level figure on a vehicle that is still in prototype stages. Two contractors are competing in a winner-take-all contest with down select in 2027 and a full rate production decision planned for around fiscal year 2029. The XM-30 demands a lot at once, a 50 millimeter cannon with programmable airburst ammunition, optional unmanned operation with a reduced crew, two or three soldiers under armor, a hybrid electric powertrain for silent watch and reduced signatures, protection against top attack and drone threats rivaling or exceeding current Bradleys, Early OMFV concepts require two vehicles per C-17 
a constraint that helped kill the first iteration. The Army later dropped that requirement, accepting that even one such vehicle per C-17 was ambitious given armor and growth needs. Meanwhile, Bradleys are actually fighting. The U.S. has delivered over 300 M2 Bradleys to Ukraine since 2023. According to U.S. and allied statements compiled by congressional researchers and independent analysts, as of November 2025, open source damage tracking shows 185 Ukrainian Bradleys confirmed as destroyed, damaged, captured, or abandoned, 96 destroyed, and the remainder disabled or captured, but often after protecting their crews. Russian analysts have taken note. In April 2025, Russian engineers examined a captured M2A2 ODSSA Bradley. Their tests reportedly found it superior to the Soviet-era BMP3 in almost every survivability metric, better protection against gunfire, shell splinters, and landmines. They also assessed that the Bradley's 25mm cannon has roughly doubled the practical effective range of the BMP3's 30mm gun when firing modern Western ammunition. Then, in October 2025, former Russian chief of the general staff, General Yuri Baluyevsky, and defense analyst Ruslan Pukov publicly described the Bradley as an ideal vehicle for the type of high-intensity, mechanized warfare Russia is facing in Ukraine. When your adversaries capture your 40-year-old equipment, dissect it, and declare it ideal for the current war, they're admitting indirectly that your upgrade strategy works. The Bradley's real victory isn't just in how many Russian vehicles it's helped destroy. It's in how it has reshaped the debate over whether to chase revolutionary concepts or keep evolving what already survives under fire. The Bradley story isn't just about one vehicle that refuses to die. It's a window into how the U.S. Army actually modernizes. The Army plans and capability timelines. The M2A4-A4 E1 upgrade path keeps mechanized infantry viable into the 2040s to 2050 timeframe, while the XM30 is expected to start replacing some Bradleys and frontline units in the late 2020s and 2030s if it hits its milestones. That means a long overlap where both platforms operate side by side, just like older Abrams tanks continue to serve alongside the latest M1, A2, SE, PV3, and future M1E3 or F-15 EX fighters fly alongside stealth F-35s. What we're seeing is evolutionary warfare. A Bradley M2A4 E1 with Iron Fist APS, updated sights, and a modern digital backbone is dramatically more survivable and lethal than a Bradley from even five or 10 years ago. When XM-30s start showing up, they won't instantly replace that capability. They'll augment it taking on the highest risk missions while Bradleys fill out the rest of the brigade's frontage. The wild card is combat experience. Bradley crews in Ukraine are inventing tactics on the fly, using 25 mm fire to blind tanks, integrating with FPV drone teams for real-time targeting, and exploiting urban cover to outmaneuver heavier Russian armor. None of that existed in any US field manual a few years ago. Now those lessons are feeding back into both Bradley doctrine and XM-30 requirements. The U.S. has also relearned a brutal truth, attrition. Losing around 185 Bradleys in under two years of high-intensity fighting is sobering. In a war with China over Taiwan or a larger conflict in Europe, armored forces would burn through vehicles at shocking rates. Peacetime production lines designed for a few dozen vehicles a year suddenly look laughably small. That's why the Bradley matters. It's not about chasing a flawless sci-fi infantry fighting vehicle. It's about having enough good vehicles upgraded to survive modern threats, supported by an industrial base that can keep cranking them out when the shooting starts. In warfare, quantity has a quality all its own. The Bradley, once written off as a Cold War relic, is proving that again by surviving, adapting, and still punching above its weight on the most lethal battlefields of the 21st century. So the next time you see a Bradley, don't think retired Cold War relic. Think 40-year-old problem Russia still hasn't solved. The army tried to kill this thing four times. The battlefield voted no. If you want more deep dives on the machines rewriting modern warfare, hit subscribe, drop a comment, and I'll see you in the next one.